Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Schmaltz, Professor of History at Northwestern Oklahoma State University's Social Sciences Department, along with Dr. Aaron Mason, um, on, our far, on your far left. Um, I am also the co-executive director of Northwestern's Endowed Institute for Citizenship Studies. And we are very, very grateful to have a wonderful turnout for a very special speaker. Um, first of all, a few opening remarks here. I want to thank you all for attending this year's annual Constitution Day event. This is our first time on the Eden campus. We do want to extend a warm thank you to Dean uh, of the Eden campus, Dr. Wayne McMillan, for helping us out with Canvas Ream and all the staff who have been so helpful in getting us uh, set up for this uh, event on the Eden campus. Also, um, I want to thank the Social Sciences Department and the Senior Administration also for helping us out. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to host this year's guest speaker, Dr. Zudi Jasser, the founder and president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy, also known as the AIFD. And tonight he'll be sharing his valuable insights on Islam, the U.S. Constitution, and the future of representative democracy. The devout Muslim, Dr. Jasser, founded the AIFD following the 9-11 attacks against the United States. He lends a strong voice seeking to promote an American Muslim voice, advocating for the preservation of the U.S. Constitution and liberty and freedom through the separation of mosque and state. Dr. Jasser is also the acclaimed author of the book, A Battle for Islam, for the Soul of Islam, A Battle for the Soul of Islam, An American Muslim Patriot's Fight to Save His Faith, published in 2012, by Simon & Schuster. Uh, we have several of his book copies on the table, uh, which will be available for sale after uh, our event. We also have a number of pamphlets and other materials pertaining to his organization and related issues. We also have his website posted on the screen as well, as you can see. But feel free to stop over after the event. Also, we have uh, handing out brochures and free copies of the US Constitution. And we do also have available some materials through the Institute, including our Civitas Journal, our annual publication, they're also available for sale. So in any case, please feel free to stop over afterwards. Um, also, uh, to move ahead here, um, Dr. Jasser is a first-generation American Muslim. His parents fled the repressive regime of Syria back in the mid-1960s. Uh, he's American-born, he earned his medical degree on the U.S. Navy scholarship, serving for a distinguished 11 years as a U.S. Navy medical officer, achieving the rank of lieutenant commander. He is presently a respected private physician in the Phoenix, Arizona area. And he specializes in internal medicine and nuclear cardiology. He is also the past president of the Arizona Medical Association. And with that, I'd like to get started. And with that, Dr. Mason, you may begin. Thank you very much. discussion you're going to hear tonight, the quality of the speaker will more than compensate 
those deficiencies. Mm -hmm. So, with that said, I, I want to thank Dr. Jasper for coming here tonight. He overcame a lot of hurdles to get here tonight, primarily those don't travel. You know how that is by air, and that was an issue. But we, we got him here, and that's the thing that really matters. So, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, could you begin the evening by just telling us briefly a little bit about your family story, how your people came here, and how you ended up in the United States? Thank you. Uh, let me first thank Aaron and Eric and all of you for uh, having this. Uh, you know, our organization's mission is focused on bringing the principles of the U.S. Constitution to not only American Muslims, but we think it's something that we should operationalize globally. And um, there's nothing more dear to my heart than Constitution Day. Uh, maybe second only to Independence Day, uh, July 4th. But, um, you know, I think that to come to towns like this, uh, I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin. Um, my parents had lived there for 20 years, and then on their way to Arizona, they lived in Arkansas for a few years. Um, my father's a physician, uh, had escaped Syria in 1966, uh, right on the day of graduation from medical school. He did show up for graduation because if you show up, you get funneled into the military. And uh, in Syria, joining the military is not an honorable thing. It's uh, joining a a fascist militia that treats its uh, citizens like animals. So um, most honorable people uh, do not join the military in Syria. Uh, so it had conscription, uh, and he ended up leaving. They escaped into Lebanon, waited a few years until they were able to get here. And uh, I was born in Ohio. Uh, he ended up opening a practice in Wisconsin. And I'll tell you, you know, the, one of the things that we were talking about is 53% uh, of Americans have never met a Muslim. And, uh, you know, post 9-11, there was uh, numbers that were around 34, 35% of Americans felt that the religion of Islam was something to be afraid of, which were staggering numbers at the time. Now those numbers are over 65%. And a lot of that has to do with ISIS. A lot of that has to do with the vacuums that have been created in the Arab Awakening. We're going to get into a lot of that. But that's why in the first part of my book, it just is about me, because uh, you know, what is amazing about the American culture and mindset is that despite some of our ethnocentrism, despite some of our, yes, and we have to admit there's probably, there is some xenophobia in America, and we've gone through a uh, civil war that rejected some deep endemics, uh, uh, racism and slavery, and we then had a uh, civil rights movement in the 60s that continued to repair that. We're still fixing some of that. But the bottom line is, is our founding fathers had principles of a constitution based in a republic with a check, which was the Bill of Rights. And there's a reason the word democracy is not in our constitution. And my grandfather used to tell me that, uh, you know, democracy is a great idea. And you know, we call our organization the American Islamic Forum for Democracy because democracy is what people view and think about when they talk about functioning <coughs> modern societies. But the bottom line, the reason the word, and I'm sure the political science professors can tell you, the reason the word is not in our documents is a true democracy is three wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner, right? <laughs> that's not my quote, that's from Ben Franklin, I think. <laughs> um, but, you know, the bottom line is, is that the amazing thing is we're a republic that defends the rights of minorities, that, that recognizes that every individual has a right to equality, regardless of what faith you are, regardless of what race, skin color, um, and uh, heritage, etc. And this is, I think, the American experiment that has been unique in the planet, and especially that first freedom. Our first freedom in America is religious liberty. Uh, Europe has a much bigger problem right now with radical Islam, I believe, because their religious liberty understanding is different than ours. And, and we'll get into that also. But So when you look at my background, growing up in Wisconsin, I, I was taught that I could be more Muslim in Nina, Wisconsin, which had three Muslim families, and we built a mosque that cost $30,000 at the time, a little two-room mosque. And I remember my family saying that, you know, eventually there were 10, 15 families and with uh, students from the University of Wisconsin, Oshkosh and Appleton. And they said, even if the Saudis, which the Saudis are known to do, right, is they want to build mosques. And even if the Saudis uh, insisted to give us money, we wouldn't take it because they felt and they taught me that that money is not the property of the royal family, it's not the property of uh, Muslims to use
choose to spread Islam, it's the property of their citizens in Saudi Arabia, and it should be used to feed their poor, to improve their societies, but instead those, those mafiosos or royal families use it to destroy their societies and plate their faucets in gold and drive uh, Bentleys and, and forget about the poor in their societies. And the Arab Awakening is beginning to correct that, but I will tell you that my narrative of my family growing up was that there are some mosques, you go to the LA mosque, large Saudi funded mosque, uh, in Tempe, Arizona, large Saudi funded mosque, there's a lot of Islamic schools in America and mosques that have received foreign funding. And as much as they'll tell you that right now there's no foreign influence because they're all domestic you know, Muslims that are American, you can't deny the fact that a lot of the silence, a lot of the inability of our community our faith community to confront dictators and kleptocrats and corrupt leaders is because those leaders have bought lobbying positions in America. They funded a lot of the infrastructure of Islamic organizations. And you know, one of the things I learned in Mina was my faith was about a personal relationship with God, learning about the Quran, uh, learning about American society. My parents taught me that to be good friends with a religious Orthodox Jew or Christian or Buddhist or, or Hindu who was honest and moral and, and treated their brothers and sisters like they want to be treated themselves was more important than befriending other Muslims who, you know, may be corrupt but yet pray and wear the hijab. You know, so the issue is actually the morality of your friends, not the faith identity. While right now a lot of the Islamist movements and so to me, growing up in a small town in Wisconsin, religion was about personal faith about learning Quran, learning Arabic. It was a personal understanding and, and religion was more of a faith about how to treat others. When I went to the University of Wisconsin, I all of a sudden wanted to become part of Muslim organizations and go to the mosque. My mom insisted that I go to the mosque in Milwaukee. And um, all of a sudden I started hearing sermons that were, this was 1985. Every Friday the sermon was about how America was imperializing Afghanistan and and uh, that the Mujahideen were fighting a jihad, but the, uh, the CIA was controlling them. The next week's conspiracy theory was about the Zionist control of American media and American industries. The next week's conspiracy theory was about Western this and Western that. And it was, I called my parents and say, why are you telling me, to, these are not religious sermons, these are political sermons. These are not only political sermons, they're anti-American, anti-Western. It's not really the narrative that I understood. I, and she said, well, talk to the imam. So I went to the imam and talked to him and said, I'm, you're taking time from my class and my studies to, to give me sort of Middle Eastern politics that I, number one, disagree with them, and number two, it's a waste of time. And he said, you don't know anything, you're not a scholar, you don't have a PhD in Sharia, be quiet, go to the back of the mosque, you're just a freshman in college, you don't have an opinion. And I tried to go a few more times, and then I just didn't go. I then became close friends with uh, some of the Indonesian, Malaysian community that, it's interesting, the non-Arabic Muslim cultures are often less politicized in religion. And this is not to generalize, but it's just what I found in my experience. Uh, uh, so in Ramadan and other faith traditions, that's sort of the community that I had gotten to know well. Fast forward, uh, I decided to go on a Navy scholarship to medical school and um, it was also because I was taught that actually the, the special sauce in America is, yes, the Constitution is great, but as you know, a lot of very autocratic countries have beautiful constitutions on paper. The Russian or the Soviet Constitution actually looks similar to ours in many ways, and yet it's one of the worst societies in the world. Um, so what makes America work is the fact that our military is not only honorable and moral, it takes orders from the civilian government and is not a deep state like it is in Egypt, is not its own uh, authoritarian rule, and it's actually something honorable to join the military in the United States. Uh, that is a narrative that my family taught me, and I felt I had to join uh, the military once I decided what I wanted to do, which was to become a physician. Uh, so uh, I've written a lot of pieces about, well, why, you know, what is the reason why, you know, there are a number of Muslims who serve honorably, um, and you know, one of the chapters in my book was about Nidal Hassan. And Nidal Hassan committed uh, the Fort Hood massacre on uh, November 5, 2009. And there's nothing actually that shook me. I thought 9-11 shook me a lot when we formed the American Islamic Forum, but 
Fort Hood did more to me. And the reason is, is if you look at his resume, I mean, Dal Hassan's resume is painfully similar to mine. He's, I don't think he was born here, but I think his family moved here when he was six or seven. Was on military scholarship, went to use his uniform service in medical school in Bethesda. Was an army psychiatrist, so this guy did not go to sleep one night, a patriotic, American, compassionate psychiatrist, and then wake up the next day an Al-Qaeda operative for Imam Awlaki. And the guy who radicalized him, Imam Anwar Awlaki, was an American-born Imam who was radicalized in Colorado, in San Diego, in Northern Virginia. So his radicalization process of the Imam, who then radicalized Ibn Hassan and countless others, his tapes are still all over the world, <coughs> we took on a drone attack in Yemen. Um, but the bottom line is, is that you look at the narrative, there's a continuum there. And the fact that individuals like, you know, Nidal Hassan, we need as Muslims to look at what was the atmosphere at home about America, about Islam, about the role of faith and, and uh, society and culture as he was joining the military as he was participating in what, what is American society. And I think ultimately, what I've found in my experiences, and um, I think there is science to back this up, have we done the studies we need to know, but I will tell you that sermons that say that America is killing Muslims, that America killed a million Muslims in Iraq, which is false, but yet propaganda on Al Jazeera and a lot of Muslim media, uh, or that uh, America went to Afghanistan imperially. I remember coming back when I was in, uh, <coughs> dock on a ship. I was on the USS El Paso for two years. We went to Somalia in 1993. And I remember I, I decided I was going to go to the largest Muslim organization's annual meeting, which is the Islamic Society of North America. Now again, I'm not trying to impugn all the members. There's, that's the largest American Muslim organization. And the vast majority of the members there, I think, are sort of oblivious to what their leadership does. But I'll tell you, I went uh, to that meeting. Uh, they had before the Islamic Society of North America meeting, a meeting with the Islamic Medical Association, and I, I talk about this in my book. And one of the booths was about the Somali Relief Fund. And I went to them thinking, oh wow, I wanted to tell them how I was right offshore of Mogadishu, and we were there to try to take food, and you know, and it was just a disaster because, uh, as many of you recall, uh, what happened to us, and our, our troops were dragged through the streets there because of how tribal that entire mess was. She looked at me and, and there were posters, I went up, and there were brochures just like we have ours on the table that said America's imperializing the Horn of Africa, that we're there in order to take over Somalia. I looked at her and I said, do you know anybody that's been there? Have you ever talked to an American soldier that has been there? I was there. We are not imperializing Somalia. We were trying to, it was called the CNN war because America eventually ended up going there because we, we saw so much famine and, and human suffering that we ended up doing something. We ended up leaving because it, it was really not workable. So the, the long story short is that the conspiracy theories and unfortunately the media and the narrative, not only in media but at home, from some of our immigrant parents that, you know, I think the, some of the divisions, if you can make some generalizations, I think families that came to America for political refugee, for political asylum, coming to freedom, would never teach their kids that America is that it's core evil and imperialistic. I'm not saying that all our soldiers do fantastic things and we're all angels, but I think the vast majority of our soldiers are honorable, patriotic people that want to do the world good. You know, yes, there's the Abu Ghraibs of the world and there's certain things that we did in Vietnam, et cetera, but those are the same percentage of criminals we have in society, we have in our, in our armed forces. This is not a generalization that ends up becoming the meme that is spread about the American there was a professor at the University of Arizona who I tried to uh, confront publicly just six months ago who said that the American military commits more acts of sexual violence against women than ISIS does. This was what he was teaching kids at the University of Arizona. So, and this is a Muslim professor, by the way. So these things really affect me. And I think that ultimately the narrative, I decided after 9-11 that the root cause had to be confronted which was this narrative about the West versus the East. It's not a war of Islam versus Christianity, it's a war of liberty versus uh, Islamism or political Islam, which we'll get into in a sec. But I do think the identity 
uh, for every conspiracy theorist that's a Muslim, there are the vast majority of American Muslims that love this country, that believe in freedom, that want to see their country shed their dictatorships. Unfortunately, they don't have a dominant voice in America right now. I think most of the organizations that speak on behalf, I mean, the Muslim Student Association that I saw was all political. It wasn't just about faith, and I think we haven't gone through, uh, unfortunately, many of the organizations that we get pulled into are victim-mongering organizations that say that, well, as a Muslim, you're a victim of bigotry, you're a victim of uh, civil rights abuses. That's what you need to stand up for. Forget the injustices done by other Muslims against Muslims all over the planet. You know, right now, we're a victim of what's happening in America. I didn't, that wasn't how I was raised, um, and uh, ultimately, that's why I joined the military, and we can talk about what happened after 9-11. Well, let's go ahead and kind of jump into the question that a lot of us are asking as outsiders to Islam. Uh, is Islam in need of a reformation? Uh, and if so, or some sort of, uh, to, to provide, you know, some, uh, some uh, benchmark here, you know, an enlightenment. Uh, is, is that, in your opinion, is that the, the seminal point at which Islam now finds itself? Is it in need of an enlightenment, number one? Number two, is, is that a possibility? Well, you know, this is a probably the, not only the focus of my work, but I think the, the major issue that our world is facing today. Why? Because Islam is a religion of a quarter of the world's population. So, um, on the one hand, as I testified to Congress in 2011, we had uh, Congressman King and Homeland Security Committee had a hearing on Muslim radicalization. And one of the chapters of my book focuses on that hearing. Um, and you know it, had, it was it was billed as the most controversial hearing since the McCarthy hearings, and it was billed as this uh, attempt by Congress to attack Muslims and put them on the spot, et cetera. Bottom line is, when I testified, I said, "Listen, I'm a physician, and when a patient comes into my office, they might have six symptoms: chest pain, cough, uh, fever, et cetera. But we get taught in medicine, which is part of the scientific method. Typically, patients come in with many symptoms, but one diagnosis." And while there may be Al-Qaeda, there may be Assad's of that Hussein, there may be uh, Muslim Brotherhood and all these issues, to me as a Muslim, the one issue is political Islam or Islamism, which is the common threat. And they might all have different reasons and, and manifestations related to different uh, national reasons uh, based on geo geopolitics, but I still think it's a common diagnosis and a common cancer. I also testified that this is a Muslim problem <coughs> that needs a Muslim solution. So while you want to identify it as, if you don't call it a Islamism or call it a Muslim problem, you're going to prevent engaging the very community you need to fix this. And yet, if you overshoot and you call it Islam, you're going to alienate also the very community that you need to fix this. So this seems complicated, so as a result, both the Bush administration and the Obama administration. And, and as Michael Gerson has written frequently in the Washington Post, uh, who uh, was President Bush's speechwriter, he says, no president can ever take on a religion. This is, you know, the, uh, the, the and he called them the far right, uh, as we see a battle within the conservative movement to, uh, you know, talk about how should conservatives approach Islam. Uh, you know, should they, uh, there truly is a movement that is pretty clearly anti-Islam. Uh, but I don't even use the term Islamophobia. This is a term that was generated by the OIC, which is 56 countries that are the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. I call them the Islamic Mafia at the UN. It's basically the rulers, the autocrats of Islamic countries that came up with this term in the late 90s. And basically what they, in the United States, it's used interchangeably for the term I use, which is bigotry against Muslims. There is just as bigotry against Jews and anti-Semitism, there has been racism uh, against blacks and others, there is palpable bigotry against Muslims. But that's how you deal with it. Islamophobia is actually a term that's used to suppress criticism of Islam, which is exactly what Saudi Arabia does, Afghanistan, other countries do in trying to prevent critical thinking. So what they've done is enact blasphemy laws 
indirectly in America by having everybody be afraid of being called an Islamophobe. In my organization as a devout Muslim who my kids are learning Quranic memorization and you know here I am trying to defend myself on why I'm a good Muslim. Why? Because they list me on a list of America's top 20 most threatening Islamophobes. And what does that mean? It means I ask questions in, about Islam and that I'm trying to uh, talk about reform. So when you talk about Islamic reform, yes, non-Muslims cannot do the reform. And there are a lot of very intellectual scholars of Islamic law that are working on reform. There are thousands of those doing it. <coughs> but what are we talking about? And I, I would ask you to not try to apply too many paradigms from non-Islamic history. Because if you try to apply the Martin Luther paradigm, let's say, first of all, Martin Luther was in many ways an anti-Semite, and, and so he had his problems. But yet he also brought about critical discourse within the house of Christianity. And so the reform that needs to happen in Islam, certainly I would recognize, and I, 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 my work is focused significantly on trying to say that, you know what, enough of the apologetics. My Islam is a peaceful Islam. Islam actually does not mean peace, it means submission to God. It's derived from the word salam, but there's a lot of apologetics out there to say that, well, Islam is a religion of peace. Well, Muslims are not pacifists. We, we, we do believe in just war. Uh, the Quran has many passages that uh, talk about uh, when war is, is permitted to, to defend yourself, etc. Uh, these apologetics about jihad are also uh, a bit over the top often and that uh, we have to recognize that 21st century meaning of jihad is holy war and that it is used as a concept to collectivize Muslims in a war against non-Muslims. Uh, so now, does jihad have other meanings as personal struggle? Does it you know, I have two very good friends that first name is Jihad. I'm sure their, their mothers did not want to name them Holy War, okay? Um, but the bottom line is, is you know, it's, trying to, it's like trying to uh, prove to the world that Xerox doesn't mean copy or, or, or Kleenex, for those of you from Nina, uh, you know, uh, doesn't mean facial tissue. I mean, it's, it's the way it's been branded globally. So these are concepts that, and we can get into this when we talk about the Quran, but uh, these are concepts that need to be reformed. And what I can tell you is the true reformation is going to come when Islamic scholars with PhDs in Sharia, in Islamic law, or jurists, begin to write a new school of thought. Right now there are four major schools of thought in Sunni Islam, uh, Hanbali, Maliki, uh, and uh, uh, two others, and then there's uh, uh, Jafari school of thought, and Shia Islam, there's Sufi Islam that has their schools of thought. As a Sunni, which are 90% of the world Muslims, I will tell you that I believe, and if you look, uh, there, what is a school of thought? Now, there's the personal legalisms of Sharia that tell me how to pray, how to fast, you know, how to bury the dead, how to do personal acts of pietistic Islam. So, uh, you know, it's interesting, there was a, a referendum in Oklahoma uh, about Sharia. And we initially, and that, that's still on our website, uh, our organization actually came out in favor of it. Uh, now, obviously, that me being as a Muslim organization in favor of a, a referendum against Sharia sounds like something that would be used by my enemies and certainly has been used. Uh, but uh, we are not against Sharia. Uh, but I'm talking about personal pietistic Sharia. You talk to Ray Bedawi in Saudi Arabia, who is a Muslim that runs an organization called Free Saudi Liberals, who tried to question the clerics, was a devout Sunni, three months ago was whipped in front of the largest mosque in Jeddah. Why? For apostasy against Islam. He never left Islam, he's a devout Muslim. But he questioned the clerics, the Wahhabi clerics. He said that their interpretation of Islam is wrong. He said that he hit the like button on a Christian Facebook page, which they said was blasphemy. So that version of Islam needs reform. My version of Islam, I think, is one that we have reformed by living in America peacefully. But for Muslims who say that, well, we do reform, we don't accept that, I would ask them, ask them to give you a legal text of Islamic jurisprudence that, that defends what they say. There isn't one. There is not. There are scholars that have given speeches and lectures that say we need to end this cutting of the hands, we, you know, or hadood punishments it's called, we need to end the second class status for women, all these things that need reform. 
they talk about it, and there are many imams that talk about it. But have they ever had a collection of imams put together a legal jurist, juristic textbook to begin, just as the Christian church went through a reform of canonic law in Europe, and it still is doing that. And so the long answer, to bring it to full circle, is that that reform of Sharia is going to need another 50 to 100 years. But it will never start unless what I think can happen in my lifetime, which is the separation of mosque and state. Until you get the clerics out of controlling government or having a symbiotic marriage with government, which is what's happening in Syria, Saudi Arabia, uh, the so-called secular states where the secular dictators end up creating and fueling one form of Islam that they are able to control for the, as Marx used to call it, the opium of the masses versus the countries where it's completely merged, as in Iran or Afghanistan when the Taliban was controlling it, or the Brotherhood uh, in Egypt when they were running it, when Morsi had his two years. Um, but the bottom line is, is that that's going to take a long time. But the, the separation of mosque and state, one and a half years of the Muslim Brotherhood running Egypt did more to defeat theocracy in Egypt than 70 years of Nasser, uh, Nasser, Sadat, Mubarak, or any of these dictators who supposedly were against the Brotherhood, right? Why is that? Well, because autocratic, hermetically sealed societies where you can't have debates, where you can't have conversations, where you have 50 newspapers that criticize the Brotherhood, the Salafis, and all other groups, uh, where you can't have that dynamic, ends up creating an underground system where the only you know, the only ones that survive are the most ruthless and autocratic types. ISIS is a perfect example. ISIS has survived a militant genocidal revolution uh, um, where the Assad regime has killed hundreds of thousands and displaced millions because they're the only type of organization that could survive that. And he's also letting them survive, which we'll talk about uh, towards the end. Uh, but. I think in our, in our lifetime, just as in the West, this is nothing new to Americans. Don't, I, and, and if you find this to be complex, please forget about Islam. Think about the Founding Fathers. The fight against theocracy is an, ex, is, is an intrinsically American fight. That's what created America. So why is it so hard for me to find alliances in a fight against theocracy as an American Muslim? I don't get it. It's like. If I say Islamism, you know, they either tell me, oh, that's too politically hard and it's never going to happen, or they say you're generalizing against Muslims and maybe they, they want to live under theocracies and who are we to export democracy and I get all these other apologetic answers. So I think in our lifetime we will see the separation of mosque and state. We will see the relegation of the clerics to just the universities and the mosques. Let them do their work of reform there and keep them out of government, out of the public space. Uh, where they control the laws, have the laws be based in secular common law. And, and the whole question comes down to, should the Quran be the source of law or a source of law? I, you know, my critics tell me that I'm trying to create an anti-Islamic society. Not true. Our founding fathers were not anti-Christian, and yet the word Christian is not in our documents. And this is exactly what I'm trying to do in, within the Muslim community, is teach them that you can be very Islamic President Wahid in Indonesia had a book called The Illusion of the Islamic State, and he said you should have a state of Islam in your heart, but we never want or should ever have an Islamic state. And that's really what we're doing. That's the reform that has to happen. You mentioned uh, comparisons with the condition of, of Europe today, and uh, you made an illusion that uh, you think Europe has gotten this issue of, of Muslims within their society all wrong. Can we address some of those issues? Are, are those cultural issues? Are they institutional issues in government? I, I've talked in my class, it's interesting, for all the talk about how liberal governments are in terms of liberal democracy in Western Europe, they, they actually follow some rather unliberal, un un illiberal policies. Like they mix church and state, you know, whether it's Britain, uh, Norway, they still have state churches. So if, if you were to try, is, is it, is it Institutional practices. I know that if you look at uh, in the Netherlands right now with Geert Wilders, who is probably, you know, all that side, I would assume he was, you can tell.
tell me. Uh, is he, a, is he just an anti-Muslim kind of guy, or is he uh, reacting rationally? And I'll let you decide. But he certainly represents that um, that perspective of, of anti-Islam feelings. Is that what? What does Europe have wrong about this? What do we have right? What can we learn from the European West specifically? Uh, That's a great question. I think is actually you know probably one of the more important questions for today is. You know, it's interesting, my parents taught me that they felt American the moment they stepped off the airplane when they came to the United States. Because there's something about Americanism, which is about religious liberty, about immigrants, about that Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, the welcoming of immigrants, etc., and that we share a common ideology. European identity, and this is why, you know, if, you, if you're taking notes, the conflict, the number one issue is about identity. Identity, identity, identity. This issue is the jihadists, forget about the religious identifications, etc. The jihadists get recruitment into their movement because they tap into Muslim identity. So a Muslim who is otherwise normal and wants freedom will all of a sudden become radicalized because he feels, he or she feels their identity is wedded to the Islamic State and jihad. Europe's problem is that it doesn't infuse, instill within its immigrant population a joint identity with their national identity. I was, I've been to the Netherlands twice, uh, been to uh, France and, and spoken in uh, Denmark and elsewhere. And there's a number of differences with America, but the primary one I've found, and you know, there's a, a Syrian scholar by the name of Bassem Tibi. T-I-B-I, -I, and he wrote a, many books, but his last one was about Islamism. And uh, one of the quotes that's in uh, talks I give is that he talks about how the secularization, and not 21st century secularization, but 18th century secularization, the 18th century secularization of Christianity did not bring about its demise, but brought about its thriving in society. And because he said taking the government out of the domain of religion and preventing the establishment of religion allowed individuals to have personal relationship with God under God and not have that dictated by government. Unfortunately, what happens, in, and he, when he retired, here's a German scholar, he was raised in Germany, Syrian extraction, did, did all of his work, when, and when he retired, he said, you know what, I'm going to retire in the United States. He said he had grown up in Germany, but he never felt German. Because the German identity was not based in ideology, it was based in race, land, family history. So he could never really feel German even though he felt he wanted to be German. But yet there was no shared common identity. When I went to Amsterdam, I spoke to the mayor of Amsterdam in 2008. I did a program on citizenship and democracy in Amsterdam. And uh, this was at the time uh, when there was the assassination attempt uh, on uh, I am Hersey Holly's colleague, uh, Van Gogh, and, uh, and others there that uh, there was in Korea, and this was long before uh, ISIS. I went and talked to some Islamic schools there, and I talked to Muslims, and this is what you were talking about. Do you know that Islamic schools, like any religious school, get mandated state funding? And that's their version of separation of state and religion, which is that if you have a religious school so that religions aren't discriminated against, they must get the same funding as non-religious public schools. So what happens is you have the ghettoization of communities where I went and talked to Muslims, eighth, ninth graders that hadn't talked to a non-Muslim in four or five months. So there's very little assimilation. And yet when I asked them, I, and most of them are Moroccan and Algerian in, in the Netherlands, I asked them, how many of you want to go back to Algeria or Morocco? And most of them had not even ever been there, um, but none of them wanted. And they all want, they prefer to live there from in their countries that their parents came from because they understood the freedom that they had. But yet the narrative of what it meant to be Dutch. So when I talked to the mayor of Amsterdam, I said, you know, listen, you need to have poetry contests, literature writing, et cetera, where your youth are writing about what it means to be Dutch. And they're not doing that. They haven't embraced that. And now as we see millions of Syrian refugees pouring into Europe, this problem is is going to just exacerbate more and more. So the American narrative about religious liberty, about embracing immigrants, about everybody being from somewhere else, 
and uh, call it a melting pot or a salad bowl, whichever way you want to look at it. I prefer the salad bowl because you don't want to lose your cultural identity when you come here. You want to allow it to, uh, you know, create diversity, but yet we should have common national um, things that we share, with, be it our language, um, be it our rule of law, etc. So, you know, I think this is the problem with Europe. It's identity, and it's a hyper-secularization where the public display of religion. I was told when I was giving lectures, don't mention God too much because the church going right here is just really low. You know, in America, my understanding, it's 65% by some Pew studies, 65% of Christians go to church uh, on almost a weekly basis. Um, in, in Europe, it's 10 to 15%. Now, Muslims may say, well, how does that affect us? It affects Muslims a lot. Because when I grew up in Wisconsin, the fact that my friends all celebrated Christmas and wanted to, to, to cherish and lift up their holidays publicly made me feel that I could ask for the same rights and benefits. While if a society is anti-religious and condemns public displays of a cross or a yarmulke, which is exactly what's happening. So you see, as the rise against Islamic um, communities happens in Europe, you're seeing huge spikes in anti-Semitism, xenophobia and other issues in Europe too. So, uh, you know, the identity of the community is very important. <coughs> the need to maintain this balance of separating church and state and not annihilating the individual's right to express religion is kind of the key to, I think, America's success. Would you agree with that? And that's summed up in the First Amendment. That, yeah. Because that's really a, that's a positive injunction against the government. It's not about individual expression of religion. Particularly the federal government not having the authority to legislate. I, I think about the Burqa ban in France, where that was accomplished by the national legislature. One vote by the national legislature banned the Burqa. It couldn't be done in the United States by virtue of the Congress because of the First Amendment. Now, there are certain issues where states might make specific prohibitions of wearing certain things under certain conditions, be they applied to public safety or things. But I think. I would agree. I think that's something that, as Americans, we ought to be proud of. That the First Amendment protects this delicate balance between separating church and state but not destroying the individual's ability to express it. Absolutely. And that's so important in our American identity is that we forget that the First Amendment is about an establishment clause, preventing the church from establishing a religion via government. It's not about prohibiting the public displays of religion. And, you know, there are a lot of controversies about what to do about the you know, our organization has publicly defended the public wearing of hijab um, and yarmulkes and, and other personal and religious attire. Now, I will say that we were also publicly against the niqab. The, ni the niqab is an Islamic, uh, um, I would call it extreme or, or you know, a, a fundamentalist uh, wardrobe that includes the covering of the face uh, of a woman. Um, and, you know, we can get into some of the legalisms, and some may say, well, how does that affect anybody? It's a personal practice, et cetera. Number one, it's a security threat, I believe. And there have been rules passed in that went to the Supreme Court about masks that have been worn, be it in, in demonstrations, et cetera, where a society has ruled in order to identify who commits crimes, et cetera, you have to have facial recognition. Uh, same thing if you're gonna have a driver's license, et cetera. So that's part of it. But the burqa, but the burqa itself, what they wear from the shoulders down, the government should have nothing to do with that. Uh, but uh, I think facial covering, that goes beyond that. I think there's a public interest. And you've seen in Iraq, uh, our soldiers, uh, many of whom have been killed by you know, women who came uh, hiding bombs within them. And it's not as often as the male suicide bomber and others, uh, but uh, security interests have to be uh, played a role in that. One more question, because I really want the audience to be able to access your are you optimistic about the future of Islam in America? Uh, are you, that's, a, of course, a huge question, but do you believe that the American Muslim community can adapt to the social, cultural, and political norms that we have here? Are you optimistic about that? And, and obviously, that's why we found the AIFD. And, uh, yeah, I think, you know, that's, that's a great question. I, um, I think America, first of all, there's, when you talk about the role and what's gonna happen with Muslims in America, Muslims are barely 1% of the population. So a lot of this fear that, 
oh, you know, the Muslims are here to take over America. That's there's, it's, it's nonsense. There's four million, three to four million Muslims in America. That's one percent of the population. It's just not going to happen. But uh, regardless of how infused by other ideologies uh, that community may be, but the issue is, is America plays a leading role in tectonic shifts in global movements, whether we want to or not. Whether we think we can be isolationists and, and take our troops away and that somehow the world will, as long as our troops aren't there, we're not gonna impact it. The Arab awakening happened. Egypt was a Facebook revolution. Syria was a YouTube revolution and still a, a, a prolonged uh, train wreck. Uh, Tunisia. Uh, started with Twitter and Facebook. Uh, Twitter had a huge impact. These are all American technologies. So, so to say that Western technology will have nothing to do, or Western uh, uh, mindsets or influence or ideas will have nothing to do with changes within Muslim consciousness is, is not only uh, uh, being proven wrong over and over again, I will tell you that I, I think the American Muslim population has been given too much of a pass. Why? Because, you know, it's a, when I first started doing this, my family was saying, why are you doing this? You're taking on, you know, organizations that have huge global connections and, and uh, we just can't win this battle. Um, because we don't take foreign money. We don't take, uh, you know, uh, we are uh, outfinanced and uh, outmanned uh, by numbers that seem uh, almost indefeatable. But yet, this is how all movements start. And the bottom line is, is I think that as much as the Egyptians had 10 million people that went to the streets to fight the Brotherhood, so the Egyptian Muslims realized that they had to be vocal against theocracy and against the ideas of the Muslim Brotherhood. Why? Because their president was starting to put into jail and assassinating and um, arresting people for criticizing Islam, for criticizing the president, etc. Now Al Sisi is doing similar things. So listen, I'm not a fan of. The Egypt, Egyptian dictatorship, uh, but uh, certainly you have to realize that these are two different things. But more people came out to demonstrate against the Brotherhood than against uh, Mubarak. In America, Muslims have a laboratory to do things they can't do in Egypt, and yet there's no urgency to do this work because we live in a country where 99% are non-Muslim, and there's no there's no fear of Islamic theocrats taking over the White House. But yet the technology and the things we can build here. I mean, look at the Cold War. We want the, the Cold War is not over. I think if anybody looks at what Russia's doing, you, you realize the Cold War is not over. But um, the Soviet Union fell apart because we began to, we never fired a bullet directly against the Soviets, indirectly through other skirmishes, be it Vietnam or Korea or elsewhere. But the bottom line is that we did it by ideas. And if you look at some of the intellectual institutions in America today, most of them are byproducts of the Cold War. Heritage, American Enterprise Institute, uh, um, and on the left, Brookings and, and others. This is not just conservatives. A lot of now what we consider to be the mainstay organizations for foreign policy came out of an investment of America to say, you know what, the biggest threat today in the world is Soviet communism, imperialism, and we have to begin to change those ideas. When the Iron Curtain fell, Estonia and many of these countries now are thriving democracies because our scholars went there to teach them how to do that, how to build free markets, etc. Islamism is today's greatest threat. What is Islamism? Islamism is the belief by some Muslims, some statistics say 25-30% believe that Islam should be a political party movement and that once that movement takes over a government, then it becomes the identity of the state. So Islamism is the belief that the state's national identity and the state's legal system should be run by Islamic law. Not based in secular or common law, but based in Islamic law, and the president has to be Muslim, can't be of any other faith. That's what Islamism is. Now, most Muslim organizations in America don't even want you to use that term, which is absurd. And I think prevents any of this work from gaining any traction, because if we can't talk about Islamism, and they'll tell you, well, if you use that term, it's a pejorative, it means terrorist, and you know, 
how do you separate that from Islam? Americans are too stupid, they'll get too confused, etc., etc., so we can't use that term. But again, in Arabic, I didn't come up with the term Islamism. In Arabic, you go with the brotherhood are called Islamiyin. Anyone who knows Arabic knows that these are called Islamiyin, are Islamic political movements, or Harikat Islamiyin, which means movements that are Islamic. And there are many devout Muslims who are very politically active in Syria or elsewhere or, uh, underground against Islamic political movements. So American Muslims, I think, need a sense of urgency, need an American public that can thread the needle between telling them that Islam is going to hold the solution, but yet right now it holds the cancer to this problem, which is theocracy. So we need to have more engagements like this. We've tried to have, you'll look on our YouTube site at AIFD TV and you'll see a lot of debates I've had years ago with Imams, now they seem to refuse to want to do that uh, uh, because I think they see the result is that, you know, it exposes uh, sort of the emperor has no clothes. They, they uh, are pushing for certain laws and I think it's interesting that Muslims will tell you and I think where American Muslims get a pass is they'll say, oh, we abide by the laws of the land, we believe in the constitution, etc. The question is not what they'll do as 1% of the population, but the question is, is what is being taught in our mosques and our Islamic schools about what should happen when Muslims are 90% of the population? In Turkey, in Saudi Arabia, if you move to Malaysia where it's 65% of the population, what type of government would you advocate for? So if they'd say, well, democracy is voting for, you know, if you become a majority, you should be able to vote out a type of system. That actually, that tells you that those ideologies are Islamist that those ideologies are basically an ideological insurgency where they feel that democracy is a vehicle to basically win over a political system and change the entire rules of the system. So that's where the reform, and I think American Muslims who grew up in a society like this and realized that you can have a legal system based on the rule of law, based on reason, where you can infuse your beliefs in principle, where I can be pro-life or pro-choice, but if I'm pro-life, I don't go and wave my scripture in the, in the Congress. I, I use reason to say that this is a life, etc. Versus the Islamists will say, this is God's word. You have to say, you have to practice this. You have to outlaw alcohol because it says in the Quran you can't drink if you're Muslim. While, what about the reasoned argument that, okay, you choose not to drink, but yet America proved that when you make a law, it actually becomes worse. These types of things in an Islamic state are not possible. Or if they are possible, the intellectuals will give you such gyrations, they twist themselves into pretzels, that it, it, it is truly an apologetic that is deceptive. That ultimately, you have to separate. And I think American Muslims have a responsibility. And I think America has a responsibility. And we're seeing yesterday's debates, uh, and as you go through an next election cycle, you realize that there are some who believe that America, not with boots on the ground, but intellectually, monetarily, because of the gifts and, and the blessings that this country has, has a role to play in the world. And that a world in which America does not play a role is not a good place to live in. That the vacuums that get created when we leave, when we left Iraq, and that's a place we probably should have left military for a while because they need chaperoning for a while after having suffered under Saddam for 50 years. You don't have a moral society that, suffer, that comes out of Saddam Hussein for 50 years. But had we stayed there, we would have provided some type of semblance to allow them to build a civil society as we stayed in Germany and Japan and elsewhere. But yet somehow we think that if we leave, those vacuums are not gonna get filled as they have by Iran, by Russia, by China monetarily, and the evil regimes of the world are going to fill those vacuums. And the difference between Iraq and Syria is Iraq had no indigenous revolution going on. So we had to go in and break that regime with our sons and daughters. In Syria, their sons and daughters are doing the work for us. All we need to do is take sides, <coughs> is, is help those who are trying to be free. And, and I'm hearing from some candidates and others, oh, let them kill each other. And, or, or even brand, you know, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to mention any name, you know, ha had, had the audacity to say that Saddam Hussein somehow was a bulwark against radical Islam. That is unmitigated 
Baathist propaganda being spewed by our own politicians. Baathism is a fascist, socialist, Arabist movement in the Middle East. And yet, I'm, I heard a candidate spewing their propaganda last night. Saddam Hussein fueled Hamas, Muslim Brotherhood. He fueled these groups because the, the playbook in the Middle East has been, and one of my chapters in my book is about changing the paradigm, but the playbook is, and, and there's a Twitter hashtag called the uh, Arab Tyrant Manual. So if you ever want to read about some rules that we all tweet about what, what the Arab tyrants, uh, how they run their societies, one of the uh, Arab Tyrant Manual uh, books is about fuel radical groups so that you can legitimize authoritarian society. That's how Al-Qaeda, you know, the Saudi royal family supposedly are, are our allies. 15 of the 19 hijackers, oh my gosh, they happen to be Saudi. How did that happen? Meanwhile, they're fueling and paying billions into an ideology that takes even the opening prayer in our Quran, which is a benign prayer about following God to, to uh, follow his straight path, not go to those who go astray. And the Wahhabis add after astray in the translation, they put like the Jews and Christians. That's their translation, which isn't even in the, isn't even in the prayer. And yet they add that in order to sow this religious conflict. So American Muslims need to push back. You need to put some fire under my fellow core religionist feet to tell them that they need to do something. Otherwise, you know, they're going to continue to play the, the victim card in America and unfortunately not play the leadership role they need to play as tectonic shifts happen. In Egypt, they're going through Revolution 2.0. I hope they go through 3, 4, 5.0. They have a lot of different permutations yet to happen. And yet, until you have strong civil society, newspapers, journalists, academicians playing leadership roles in their media, you're not going to see an evolution towards reform. And I think Americanism, if you will, and I know we, you know, I've talked to so many in government about how do we shift these ideas. You know, who would, and you look at the State Department and they'll put on their website Muslims that are doing great as firefighters and police officers and military officers. That doesn't necessarily, I don't know what that does for Egyptians or for Saudis. I mean, great, we're telling them that Muslims do well here and that doesn't make them want to be free. Americanism is not telling the world that we don't discriminate against Muslims. That's not Americanism. Americanism is giving them the ideas that religious liberty can work for Muslims in their societies and teaching them how to make Egyptianism into a synonymous nationalism. And let's go full circle and I'll end about this, about identity. So right now, the Egyptian military is all gung-ho about Egyptian identity. But I'm sorry, the Egyptian military's solution for Egyptian identity, yes, it's anti-brotherhood, but it's not anything about liberty. El Sisi was 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 uh, allotted as a great reformer. January first, when he gave a speech and went and visited a Coptic church, which which was actually a great gesture for him to do. And he went and talked. What I believe he talked in the belly of the beast. Who's the belly of the beast? He gave the talk at El Azhar University, which is a university that generates one of the. the if if there is a Vatican for Sunni Islam, that would probably be it. Uh, other than the ones in Saudi Arabia, but Al-Azhar is probably one of the central teaching places. And he told them, we need to reform against the violence, against the killing, this is not Islam. And he was lauded on every American network. But I'm sorry, most Muslims that I know that are working in the trenches on this, listened to him and said, he never used the word liberty. He never used the word freedom. And yet, he's lauded as a reformer because he has a common enemy, which is the brotherhood. So the only difference between the Saudi royal family, El Sisi, Assad, and the Muslim Brotherhood is the Muslim Brotherhood is a grassroots populist Islamist movement. And the El Sisi's and the Saudi royal family are oligarchy, oligarchical Islamists who say, oh, the society needs to have a board of directors that runs it so we can tell you what is and it's not Islam. When it becomes a populist movement, it's dangerous. You know, it's like they're between the czar and the communists. Two different, you know, two sides of the same coin. The third option is what we need to have as a strategy, and I've been talking to as many political candidates, both sides of the party, to say that in this country we need, every president has a doctrine in the Middle East. American Muslims need to get behind a liberty doctrine and tell our presidents, our congressmen and women, 
that we need to advocate for the promotion of liberty across the world. And not only in Muslim countries, but in China, in Russia, because until we continue to promote liberty, the world will fill those vacuums with autocracy <coughs> and uh, uh, destroy human rights. Thank you. I know you have questions about the Quran. We can get into some of that in the Q&A if you want. So I'd like to I just, appreciate it. I'd like to just do that. I apologize if you don't have a microphone, but I'd be happy to recognize people. Just raise your hand. Yes, ma'am. In the back. Yeah. Um, we tried American uh, liberty ideas in, in uh, Iran under Shah Malawi, and that was quite a disaster. And it seems to me that Turkey tried uh, uh, separating mosque and state with the Young Turks. And what they had was a military that pretty much dictates even to the president and, and, and parliament. Are you sure that that is a, a, a way to go? Because whether you have mosque with state or mosque without state, you still have, either way, a dictatorship. Right, and, and they're both they're both equally bad. Um, and I think the, the huge tipping point that happened that was an opportunity for the world that the planet is missing right now was the Arab Awakening in 2011. The 20th century paradigm, to use 20th century results on the 21st century is just completely non secular because the American policy, Western policy in the 20th century was to choose the lesser of two evils and then to begin to work with the lesser of two evils to keep those lessers of two evils in power so that the more evil one did not rise up. Now, would I fault them for that? You know, even my grandfather, Zudi Jasser, who, who was a newspaper man, was in and out of house arrest in Syria. He came to America wanting to be able to spread his ideas because he couldn't do so in Syria. The Ba'ath took over in 63, he left. But even he would say, you know what? He understood it because Right now, Syria, the, the method in which the barrel bombs, chemical weapons, etc., are being used against civilians, you know where they learned that from? The Soviet military in the, in the mid 20th century. It's all Soviet techniques. It's how the Soviets killed tens of millions uh, throughout there. You know, the, remember the famine that killed uh, uh, 10 million and, uh, um, right around the early 20th century that Stalin did? That's exactly what Assad was doing in Damascus when he, and in small towns when he cut off water. Uh, uh, ways, etc. So right now we're hearing more overtly about, oh my gosh, the Russians are pushing in soldiers, etc. They've been teaching and, and giving arms. My father was put in, in house arrest for two weeks as a 11th grade high school student because he asked the school teacher, why do we use these Russian jeeps that don't work in the cold? I heard the American jeeps work a lot better in the cold. That's what he was told. So, you know, listen, the Pahlavis of the world uh, yes, we, we had some major errors, I think, in helping some of those dictators. But even my grandfather gives them a pass because the bigger threat at the time was the Soviet Union. So the Middle East was sort of a, a, a wasteland where we were sort of picking who was anti-Soviet in order to push back against the Soviets because that was a bigger global problem. The Soviet Union no longer exists. The Middle East is going through an Arab awakening. Siding with dictators is now because of open dialogue, open communication, Twitter, YouTube, etc., you can't get away with doing these things anymore. Um, everything is transparent. So the Pahlavi thing, I think, is, is no longer an issue. And even if you talk to a Pahlavi family, they will tell you that the time for democracy, the Green Revolution, was not about putting the Pahlavis back in. It was about democracy in Iran. Turkey is an example of what we were talking about in Europe. Turkey's hyper-secularism under Ataturk is actually what fueled the ascendancy underground of the AKP. The AKP is the Muslim Brotherhood of Turkey, and they've been controlling through Erdogan, now Turkey, for, for over 10 years. And they're slowly losing support, and as they lose support, Erdogan is turning more and more into a, a egomaniacal, narcissistic, uh, you know, Islamist. Right, so he still has the military over him, and that's the same situation over in Egypt where the military steps in when such things happen. Okay, so the issue is, is I will tell you there is a, a soft bigotry of low expectations to say that, well, and, and that's a term that President Bush used to use when we were talking about education in America, but there is always, you have to be careful in that, well, to say, let's support 
the dictator because at least he doesn't have expansionist views, at least he'll suppress the AKP, etc. I think President Bush 43 was right when he said every human being left to their own devices wants to be free. And yes, there are militarists in Turkey that are a check for the AKP and the Islamists and they've not allowed them to shift too much, but ultimately that third path, you know, Europe went through how many revolutions? How many revolutions did the French go through? Did, and then yet you still in Europe fell back into fascism with Mussolini and, and, and Nazism and World War II and, and even after you had democracies functioning for some time. So these things, as Reagan said, societies are only one generation away from losing, from losing our freedom. And yet gaining the freedom is also one generation away. So I would, I would say that we can't be hypocrites anymore because of the Arab awakening. We can't be hypocrites as Americans to say that we're not going to promote freedom because Muslims or Arabs need to be ruled by some kind of tribal dictator because otherwise they'll become a bunch of animals. That's just, yes, the illiteracy rates are high, 50%, 80% among women, but the solution to that is, you know, teaching them how to fish, not just giving them money, you know, helping them build institutions, and it's gonna be generational, it's not gonna happen overnight, but there needs to be a process and a, and a strategy for that. Next question. Okay, so I think we, uh, the world has three, there's three kind of things. We have um, dealing with Islam in America, and then in Europe, and in the Middle East, and they're three very different things. Um, more importantly, since we're Americans, I think that dealing with it in America is our first priority. But it's, um, it's kind of like, I'm trying to think of it. Uh, how do we go about, like, promoting the, the coexistence and like understanding of both Muslims and, and Muslims in America. Like, uh, you can see in Irving, Texas with the, the kid and the, that kind of fiasco um, kind of got blown out. How, how do we just lower that like kind of stigma that is pretty frequent in America right. towards Muslims? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. And when I tell my kids, I don't, my kids get some of this too, you know. Somebody talks, says something about Muslim or Islam, and you know, you have a seventh grader that says, "Oh, all Muslims are like ISIS," and you know, they don't realize they're talking to two of them, right? <laughs> and I'll tell you, um, I think there is nothing that would be more helpful to Muslim civil rights than for Americans to see our community, Muslim community, leading the fight to say that we have a problem and that we are gonna fix it and we are gonna be public to, to say that, you know, and admit that we are like the alcoholic that, that has to come to terms with our denial and end the denial. I think that would go so far to ebbing away that 60% fear that I had mentioned to you and that's what's happening. I remember the, you know, there was this case and I wrote a lot about it, you can look, uh, Google it, the, the flying imam case Phoenix, Arizona, where you had these imams that tried to pray at a gate, and uh, they had some inappropriate things done to them. Uh, they were taken off the airplane uh, um, in handcuffs, etc. But the bottom line is, is I still thought what they did was inappropriate. Uh, and and you know we go through this in medicine too. When you look at physicians who um, uh, you know want to be good doctors, and you wonder well, why are we sued so much, right? And you say the way to prevent lawsuits is to apologize to patients, to treat them compassionately, and, and, and what happens is when you create an antagonistic environment, that's what creates lawsuits, right? So when these imams got treated poorly, they came out, called care immediately. They're having a press conference within 30 minutes about how they were pulled off the airplane. This poor 14 year old, you know, uh, uh, listen, I, I feel for him, it could happen to my son, right? But still, the media circus that's happened is not helpful to our community. It is not helpful. Uh, it, might feel, it might feel great to do that, and he becomes an icon of Muslim civil rights, but you look at that invention that he made under an x-ray, and it looks scary. And I'm not justifying what happened to the poor kid. He brought it, but it wasn't a day for inventions. It, I mean, there's a lot of excuses. It's a teaching moment. But you make a teaching moment, and then you move on, right? And so we have to look A, at strategy, and B, 
you know, I was very vocal, and probably where you know a lot of Americans started to know about our work was during the Ground Zero mosque fiasco. And all of a sudden, you had these individuals that wanted to build a mosque at Ground Zero, and 56 percent of American Muslims thought it was a bad idea, and yet it became the the the, the rallying cry, the number one story in 2010, I think, was the Ground Zero mosque story in, in American media. And yet, the story was about religious liberty. Why can't they build a mosque? There was a mosque closer. That was a one million, one and a half million dollar mosque in New York, which is a small thing, right? It wasn't making a lot of noise. The problem was this thing was 15 stories, and it was going to take up a whole city block and, and, and cast a shadow of Ground Zero. And it wasn't a mosque. 14 floors of it were other things, swimming pools, etc. It had a mosque in it. So the issue is, is, is what is the strategy from a, a sense of humility for a, a faith community that's pretty new to America that has been given freedom that our countries, that our other core religionists have taken away from our families, and yet we come here and the mantra we teach our kids in our Muslim Liberty Project is, are we Americans that happen to be Muslim, or are we Muslims that demand to be American? Two different mindsets. So if you believe that you're a Muslim that demands to be American, AIFD is not for you know is not for you. That's not what we do, you know. But if you're an American that happens to be Muslim that loves your faith and you believe as a Muslim you should be involved in PTOs, you should be involved in your uh, local societies, etc. But not because you're a Muslim, but because you're an American, you get involved in these things. You know that, and I, and I hope that answers your question. I think we need to bring attention. And when real bigotry happens, this is my fear: is that eventually something's going to snap in the American culture, which scares me. Right? I mean, at some point you had Chattanooga, you had Fort Hood. There is some real bigotry that exists. So when that happens, we have to have the street cred to react to it appropriately. And we haven't used up all that street cred on kids with, with wires that nothing happened to the, the poor guy other than just some embarrassment. And now he's changing schools, he's, you know, it's just. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Personal responsibility is that the, the Muslim community needs to take personal responsibility and, like, even though they're just a one percent, they, they can. Uh, even though there's the, the probably the good moderate Western Muslims are a smaller percentage than the Eastern ones. We can have a bigger voice yeah. and like kind of spread the. And I think it has to do with bandwidth. Okay, yeah. so if we have bandwidth of attention to Muslim issues, if we use ninety percent of the bandwidth to talk about civil rights, Americans are going to look at that and say, "Wait a minute." You have ISIS, you've got Syria, you've got millions moving into Europe, and you guys are worried about a kid in school. That's a bandwidth of your, I mean, look at the emails coming from Muslim organizations. It's not about how do we fix, you know, how do we destroy Assad, and how do we uh, uh, put a fatwa against ISIS. I haven't gotten an email from one Muslim organization wanting to declare a fatwa against ISIS. What's a fatwa? It's a religious opinion. Why is that? Now, there is a letter to ISIS, called a letter to Baghdadi.com that was signed by 250 American imams. We're actually preparing a response to that because it's fascinating. That letter to Baghdadi, which was written and signed by many Western imams, it's led by folks from Zaytuna Institute and others, it actually says, you know what, Baghdadi doesn't have the authority, but if you're going to have an Islamic State, here's how to do it. If you're going to do jihad, here's how to do it. And I'm sorry, that's still putting lipstick on the pig, right? in that the problem is the Islamic State. The problem is we should end jihad. And once the Islamic State, you know, we wrote a, a and I brought it here, on, on the table, we have a, a ad that we had in the New York Times, a full page ad that was signed by 24 different organizations. And one of our fellows, Ahmed Banya from San Francisco, um, who's of uh, Burmese origin, uh, wrote a piece about what Muslims can do to reclaim their beautiful religion. And he wrote about how some of the details that needs to happen in Sharia, but the bottom line is, is this ad basically said, we are not only against ISIS, but against all Islamic states. And we do that as devout Muslims. That we don't believe in theocracy, that, that there needs to be an end and a movement of Muslims to be against all theocratic and political Islamic movements, including, and we name them by name, Hamas, Al-Qaeda, uh, um, Jamaat Islamiyah, all these large movements 
need to be named. And once Americans see us naming them by name, the problem is, is you put a microphone in front of some of the leading Muslim Americans and ask them, does Hamas commit terrorism? They'll say, well, everybody commits terrorism. What do you mean? You know, America does, Israel does. Then we'll, they'll, they'll ask him again, Did, are you against, do you believe Hamas is a terrorist organization? Well, the acts they do are terror. Do you believe Hamas is it? They will not answer the question. Why is that? Because that's their constituency. They don't want to offend the constituency that believes Hamas. The means may be wrong, but the ends are right. So this is the problem, is that Americans see through that and we end up not being trusted as a community. And we have to be consistent and be vocal by name of who are the problems in our, and globally, because globally feeds our credibility domestically. Yes. What can non-Muslim individuals like say those of us here in Enid, Oklahoma, who may not even know if we do know Muslims. What can we do to continue to move the narrative forward and continue to uh, push for positive change? It, or, or do we have a role in this at all? Absolutely you do. ISIS is in all 50 states. It is converting people that were non-Muslim, some from prisons, some from, uh, you know, it is a cancerous viral ideology. Uh, and by the way, you know, for those who don't want refugees from Syria because they're worried about ISIS, look at all the last attacks that have happened. Have any of those been refugees? The majority of attacks on our homeland have actually been done by the kids of immigrants. And it's because we are not engaging in this ideological battle. And I would tell you, while America, I think, is a little immune more so than Europe because of the ideological stuff we talked about, we are in a less of a trajectory than Europe for radical Islam, but we're headed in the same way until we engage political Islam. So I would tell you that whether it's with your mayor, your university directors, your congressman or woman, uh, your politicians, your senators, we need every part of the American mindset to realize that if the 21st century was focused on a cold war where the evil empire was the Soviet Union. Today's evil empire is the OIC. Not the people of the OIC, not their citizens. The citizens, and we heard one of the candidates yesterday, right? He said he would take Air Force One to go to China, to Russia, to Cuba, not to talk to their leaders, but to talk to the, the people, the citizens, the, uh, those in prison. Natan Sharansky in his book, which I would recommend to all of you, Natan Sharansky said he knew he'd be free when Ronald Reagan called the Soviet Union the evil empire. And, he's, and you say, how is that? Just by calling them evil, you know you'd be free? He said, you know what? It, it, it declared that the world was going to be focused from the bully pulpit of the White House on the evil that Soviet Union is spreading and ultimately the prisoners of conscience would be let out. Rafe Bedawi in Saudi Arabia, we wrote some of us leaders in, uh, on, I'm on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. We wrote a letter to the Saudi ambassador via the Secretary of State saying we want to trade places with him and ask the Saudi government to flog us instead of him. And these are the, and they reject, you know, they ignored it. President Obama went and talked to the king about why he shouldn't be worried about the nuclear talks, etc. Never had even two seconds to mention Rave's name. And by the way, almost every organization, left or right of center, has been mentioning Rave Bedoui's name. He's received 20 different awards in the last year from his jail cell in Saudi Arabia because of his work. So these are the things that you can champion prisoners of conscience. You can uh, create forums like this, have debates uh, where it's actually Muslims debating other Muslims so that it's clear it's not an Islam versus non-Muslim debate. Because this is the issue, is that when you have a non-Muslim debate this, it comes across that, oh, you're anti-Islam, and you just don't get it, and et cetera. But there are many Muslims, and we, you know, 20 of us signed this thing. We exist. There's, many of them are women uh, uh, leaders who are reformists, uh, because if there's anybody who's at the head of the spear uh, that is uh, suffering from Islamic law uh, instituted around the world, it's, it's women. We've seen in Phoenix alone, there were two different honor killings uh, by fathers who did not want their daughters to drink or to date, and they decided to abuse or kill their daughter. So the news covered that for one day. 
they went and got a professor from the University of Arizona to talk and say, oh, well, this is, you don't understand, it's a different culture, et cetera. Excuse me, wait a minute. They're, this is deep issues that need reform. So we can, through your different channels, and we need to invest in these things, create think tanks and institutes that are dedicated now and into, because this problem is not going to go away in your lifetime or my lifetime because these countries have long transition processes. And now with the globalization of not only our economy, but of security and jihad and other things, it's kind of come here, you know, and it has. I mean, you had a beheading here in Oklahoma. And that, you know, it was dismissed as a psychiatric illness. You know, yes, the vulnerable populations, many of these individuals are vulnerable because of psychiatric issues. But the primary virus is political Islam that then hijacks into these vulnerable individuals. So it's very different than the Colorado shooting or the you know, uh, uh, Massachusetts one or others. Those truly are psychiatric. It's not a global political movement that has a common root ideology. I hate to do this, but I think we're going to have to go ahead and cut everything short. Uh, just a couple of notes. Let me make a few statements. If you're a student here, Please go over where Dr. Decker is. She has sign-up sheets if you haven't done that yet. Uh, next thing I'd, I'd love to, I really want to invite everyone to go over and speak with Dr. Jasher. He's going to do a book signing, um, and I hope you'll uh, consider doing that. And uh, on behalf of the Institute for Citizenship Studies, I would like to thank you all for coming. Please uh, continue to watch social media. We're on uh, Facebook. We're on the Northwestern website. We do this every uh, September 17th, and of course in the in the fall or excuse me in the spring we have the presidential lecture series that we host either here or on the Alp campus. So be watching for that. Um, we have a lot of information over here regarding our institute as well as well as Dr. Jasper, so which I wholeheartedly support in going over and investigating that. And so I want to thank you for coming, and I want to have one more round of applause for Dr. Jasper.